in the journey of recovery. Uh, this afternoon, as we begin, we actually uh, have a real privilege. We've got a singer with us, a singer and musician, um, Adriana. Where is she? There she is. Come up front. Let me embarrass you for a little while. She's um, she she came up to hear Sheree Peters speak, and uh, you know how it is. We find out what she does, and so we put her on the spot and asked her to sing for us. And uh, so Adriana, she's actually uh, Australian and um, is over here just uh, temporarily visiting, but um, has a uh, actually a music ministry, Endeavor Productions. You'll find them on YouTube and online, Endeavor Productions. She and uh, Jade, uh, who works together with her musically. And um, Adriana is actually presently studying nutrition and early childhood. Is that right? She's a student and a musician, and uh, she's decided, she's volunteered, she's been put on the spot, she's, uh, she's going to sing for us, she's going to sing for us. So Adriana, thank you for that, and then afterwards, Sheree, we'll ask you just to come up and, uh, and start for us. So let's bow our heads for a word of prayer, and then we'll hand it over to our musician. Father in heaven, please will you bless us to, to this afternoon, please will you open our hearts, our minds, uh, give us ears to hear the Spirit and uh, hearts to receive the Spirit's healing. So uh, everything that happens here in the next hour or so, we pray that it will be blessed uh, with the power of heaven. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, so this song is called He Hears You. Um, it's a song that I wrote about three years ago. Um, God inspired me with the word. Uh, actually, for a friend of mine, uh, she's tried to commit suicide about three times. And every time she's been caught or someone sort of rescued her by the grace of God. And um, when I heard her story, I was like, wow, I need to write something. Or it just came to my mind from God to write this song. And I think even, you know, if you've never tried to commit suicide, you can relate to this. I can relate to it. And... Um, all different stages of, I guess, pain and um, finding God, realizing that He's in your life in a big way. And um, I put it on Facebook last year, and looking at um, where it's gone, it went all the way over to America. And Cherie Peter Peters found it and shared it, and I was like, "Wow, it's gone such a long way." And um, just praise the Lord for that. So um, it's called He Hears You. When the future is bleak, so gloomy and gray, the horizon unclear and so far away, and you feel just so silent, you don't know how to pray, he hears you, he hears you, and when you're blind to your pain, Cause it's too hard to face your purpose unknown it's all just a haze and you feel like you're treading the darkness of space he sees you he sees you cause he hears the word that you cannot say and he make and he sees a future when it's all just a haze he feels the pain when you're broken and afraid and when the cup you are drinking is tearing your soul you feel broken and helpless, out of control. Where it seems like you're going, nobody knows. He takes it, he takes it. And when you're wounded and bleeding and ready to die, when you're trembling and waiting for time to pass by and the shadow He'll heal you, he'll heal you, cause he'll never leave you there, no, he'll never let you down. You're the one he lives for even though you are cast down, cause there's no one he can't lift up, no, there's no one he can't save. Trust him and you'll find that 
takes the suffering, the tears, and the shame, and gives you the blessings again. And so I'm thinking, you know, I'm ADD, so 10 seconds could be a lifetime. It's like too much. Um, it's really interesting to me because the first time I heard that song was a little while ago, over a year ago, and I just reposted it because I, I knew so many people that just needed to hear that. And when all of a sudden we were talking yesterday and I realized that it was you and you had written that song and said, can you sing it? I'm so privileged to have you bring that message to us. So I think it was for somebody in this room, if not me. Do you know what I mean? And so thank you. Incredible. So we just did today, last night we talked about the story, where we're from, where I'm from, all that kind of stuff. Each person here has a journey. You know, every time um, I listen to someone else, I think, man, each of us have a journey. And I saw a show one time, and the show was amazing. It was this guy that came on one of the daytime talk shows, like Oprah or something, and he had a map, and the map was this huge map, and this was in the United States, so it was of the United States, and he had a, a bunch of darts. And all he did was he went, and the dart flew into the map and hit a point. And let's say that it hit Dallas, Texas. And so the entire crew went to Dallas, Texas, got a phone book, so you can tell how old the show was, they got a phone book, and then put their finger down, got an address, went to that address, and all they said was, tell me your story. Most people started out the same way. I don't have a story. And they just talked a bit. Every single person had an incredible story of survival or family or trauma or whatever. And then he went back to the studio, took another dart. <laughs> they all flew to that state, that city, that phone booth, did the same thing. And they said they could do it over and over and over. So all of us have that journey. And I really believe that if we had time, each of us, um, has a journey. So we talked about forgiveness. Forgiveness is the biggest thing. Raise your hand if you forgave someone today. Okay, so a lot of you did that forgiveness work. It's a huge thing. And sometimes it is so important to do that, and the, the all of a sudden you walk away from that injury, and, and the emotional pain that you've carried most of your life will fall off almost like dominoes. You start feeling um, healing almost like a domino. Um, and, and when I say that, I mean that because on, on my Facebook, if we're Facebook friends, you saw a post that I did a little while ago, and they had a domino about this big. Anybody see the one I'm talking about? A domino about this big. The next one beside it was about this big. Next one beside that was about this big. And it went up to one about this big, huge, right? So then they went back to this little tiny thing, little tiny domino about this big, and they pushed it, and it knocked over this 100-pound one um, without any problem. So sometimes we think that forgiveness is little tiny work. It will take down the biggest thing that you carry if you remember that the work, the primary work of your recovery is going to be the forgiveness, letting go of the very things that almost destroyed you. So now we're going to talk about restoration. And restoration I love because... So this picture is one of my favorite pictures. It's an old theater. Isn't that beautiful? Old, does it need to be restored? What part of it needs to be restored, do you think? No, no, don't tell me, because you know you never stop talking, Brian. <laughs> no, tell me. What part needs to be restored? Of what usually is 
Okay, let me, let me say all of it. Is that what you're trying to say? It's all of it. So all of it needs to be restored. And sometimes when somebody starts to do a building like that, it looks worse before it looks better. Are there any builders in the room? Literally, they start pulling out wiring, plumbing, foundations need to be knocked down. Somebody says, do we just put the gold leaf up? Absolutely not. You literally almost have to tear it down to rebuild it. So emotionally, for most of us in our lives, it feels sometimes like, are you kidding me? Because I feel worse. But God is just doing foundational work with most of us as addicts. So it literally, we think the problem is here. I thought the problem in my life was I'm a heroin addict. Obvious, right? Or that my dad molested me. God, after 21 years, said to me, you've never learned to trust or love anyone. Anyone. In fact, one time my husband said something really interesting. He said, one of these days you're going to let me love you. <laughs> and I thought, are you kidding me? We've been married by that time for 10, 15 years. And I said, you're still here, buddy. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I'm thinking, so what are you saying? And he said, one of these days. So I told God on him. I said, God, what is that? That's crazy. And I heard God say, one of these days you're going to let me love you. And I thought, what does that mean? What does that mean? And I remember just being vexed about that. It's like, you know, I have done recovery work. I'm, I've gotten my education. I'm working in hospitals. I'm married to an incredible guy. I just had this beautiful child. And what do you mean by that? And so God gives me kind of a vision. Has anybody got a vision? Not an acid flashback or some drug flashback, but just a vision, straight up. So God gives me a vision. And the vision is, I am locked in a self-built fortress, protected. I have got walls that are this thick, no windows. You cannot get at me. I'm protected. But I can't get out. I can't connect with anyone. I don't even know how to let you in because I'm so protected in here. And God said, you keep praying for recovery. And I try to take one brick out, and you tremble right? And I'm trying to get you out of there. And it's like, you, uh, will you let me? And I started crying because I thought, I don't know how to let you. You know, if you can give me a book on how to deal with anger, I'll read the book. How to, you know, give me some stuff to deal with depression, I'll do that. Give me a way to build my self-esteem, I'll, I'll do that. But teach me to trust and love, I don't know how. I don't know, even know what you're saying. And God said, surrender that to me. And that was a first step in my recovery, and it was 21 years after my last drug. 21 years, and it took me that long for God to say, the issue is you don't know how to trust. You don't know how to let people love you, and you don't know how to love. So can we start there? So for me, the restoration process, man, God was patient, was patient. But as soon as I surrendered that, and I thought, okay, then teach me. And it was the hardest thing I ever learned because I never got it as a kid. I just didn't know how to do it, but God was really faithful. So we're going to look at restoration. And restoration is amazing to me because I want you to think about your life or the life of whoever it is that you love as a building that needs to be restored, every part of it. So the next thing we're going to um, talk about in this restoration process, do you see the bottom? Can you see the bottom of that? The, the whole thing is falling down, foundations falling down. If we look at ourselves spiritually, mentally, emotionally, and if God literally said, let me put you, you as a picture, do you think you'd need to be restored at any level? Any level. And it's amazing to me to say, I, I, if you... If, not many people say, no, not me, I'm good. Most of us have some work to do. Um, there's a, a guy that I love, um, and he says, compassion is not a relationship between the healer and the wounded, but a covenant between equals. So what he's saying is that compassion or healing, literally, if I'm going to look at restoration, I cannot do this on my own. I can't take a building like that and decide, I'm good, I'm just going to go fix it, right? I need an electrician. I need a plumber. I need somebody that knows about this or that or whatever. And so you need a team. And there's something about starting to come together as a team and connecting to with, with each other that is really important in the restoration or the healing process. We cannot heal 
on our own. We cannot just sit there and think, let me think about this and let me get it and do it on our own. We have to start connecting. The reason we're really damaged is we're so disconnected in our injury, in our wounds, um, that I think we get played by the devil himself sometimes. Um, it says, in our connection with each other, it says, you stand with the least likely to succeed until success is ex succeeded by something more valuable, and that's kinship or friendship. So as I start to look at I've got a restoration that has to happen. I start to connect on any level, and I start to have friendships. In that, healing happens. In that, nobody may have an answer for me, but just in the fact that you see me and I see you, there's a bit of healing that happens. And so we're going to look at restoration in the next step. After forgiveness, after surrendering that to God, after realizing that I'm powerless to do this on my own, what is your team going to look like? Who are you going to pull around you? And this guy works with gang members, this guy um, uh, in the middle. It, he's just an amazing guy, but he works with gang members. He works in Los Angeles. In Los Angeles, six kids a, a die a night in the area that he works. A night. And this is murdered, gunshot, gang violence. And so that's his world. Um, he said that in our recovery, in our journey, that we'll stand with the belligerent, the surly, the badly behaved until bad behavior is recognized for the language that it is. And it's the vocabulary of the deeply wounded and those whose burdens are too heavy for them to carry. So when you see somebody acting out, when I'm acting out, if I'm lost in porn addiction and drugs and I'm, you know, domestic violence or religious addiction or whatever, all that says is that's the language of the wounded. To the extent that someone's wounded, they're going to wound other people. So if you see somebody around you that's still wounded, that's their language. The only thing that's going to change them is your love for them, that forgiveness process, and that connection with each other. The only thing that's going to change us in our own acting out is that. And we're going to look at um, some of the other addictions. Raise your hand if you uh, like to spend money, if you have a credit card that probably is maxed out. So we're going to look at some of those addictions. But the language of the wounded, if I'm really wounded and I'm not doing drugs anymore, but I have a credit card, I'm going to go to the mall and buy a new outfit. You know what I mean? But I'm going to do that if I'm hurt or stressed or whatever. And sometimes I have stuff in my drawers that still have the price tag on them because it's not about that. The language of my wound says I've got to shop, I've got to eat, I've got to do something. And so know that on our restoration process, we've got to start listening to the language of our wounds and or the language of the wounds of the people that we love. So um, what I think was amazing about um, this guy right here is that um, he works with some pretty intense folks. Like one of the girls he works with, she came to a meeting. She's in recovery. She's like 16 years old, and, and um, she's doing recovery for the first time. Most people in her neighborhood are dead by 25 years old. The lifespan in this area of L.A. for these kids are age 25. So she comes in, and she has got this beautiful dress on, right? Walks in, and people are stunned. Wow, you look beautiful. And it's her recovery, and she's not high, and she's got this beautiful dress on. And, and she looks at him, and she says, you know what? Will you bury me in this dress? Because she knew she looked beautiful. And he said, you look funny at 80 years old with that dress on. <laughs> and she said, nobody I know lives to 80 years old. And she was buried in that dress when she was about 18 years old. But, you know, just being able to say is that um, as we start coming out of our wounds, for some of us, they're huge. Some of us, they may not be as big, but our language is our acting out. Our language is um, our behaviors, you know. And as we start coming out and connecting with each other and having friendships and forming friendships, this particular church is going to follow this program up with a, a weekly program on friendship, on connection. And the reason we do that is we know that you cannot heal without that. Especially, a lot of times men are supposed to heal without that, right? Men, are you just supposed to be on that white horse? <laughs> you know what? Save the day, save the world or whatever. And, and everything that you do is um, about strength, right? Um, but man, there's times that you just need to talk to each other. Because, you know, sometimes you just got to say, today I'm not feeling strong. 
I'm not doing it today. This is a really tough thing, or I'm strung out sexually, or you know what, uh, you know, everything, uh, you know, financially or whatever. But I think that as we connect, even as men and women, we'll connect for different reasons, but you got to connect. So they're going to follow up with a group, and it's because of this very reason that the next part of our recovery after forgiveness is going to be connection and restoration. Um, Brene Brown, she's a re, uh, shame researcher. Raise your hand if you've ever felt shame. Do you know what I'm talking about with shame? That kind of deep sense that you just don't even want people to know this about you, uh, and you're, you're locked in that, right? So she's a, sh a shame researcher, and she says, I define connection as the energy that exists between people when they feel seen, heard, valued. When they, give, when they can give and receive without judgment, and when they derive sustenance um, and strength from the relationship or from each other. So her connection is when we start to connect with each other and I feel seen, and I feel heard. And there's healing that happens with that in research that doesn't happen any other way, any other time. Um, she also says, which I think is amazing, a deep sense of love and belonging is an irreducible need of all people. And so if you say you don't need that, I'm going to say somebody lied to you. It's an irreducible need. We need to be loved. We need to be held. Even that wombat that we talked about today dies without being cuddled. Do you know what I mean? They did research in Germany where kids died without being touched. And we're no different. And so we have to start connecting with each other in this part of rec our recovery. We are biologically, cognitively, physically, spiritually wired to love, to be loved and to belong. When those needs are not met, we don't function. Does anybody hear what I'm saying? When those needs are not, don't, uh, are not met, we do not function as we were meant to. We break, we fall apart, we numb, we ache, we hurt ourselves, we hurt others, and we get sick. And I, sometimes when somebody says emotionally sick, yes, definitely. But if we say emotionally sick for long enough, we get physically sick. Um, there are people that I, that soon as they start healing emotionally, their physical stuff starts being restored. It's a, it, it's, it, it really matters that we heal in this way. And so when, when I want to heal, I'm damaged, I don't know how to trust. For those 21 years that I tried to find any other avenue than to just be friends, I did not heal, could not heal. And I knew I got off of drugs, I knew how to deal with anger, I could teach people how to do recovery, but I could not fully heal until I started saying, hey, my name is Cherie, what's your name? You know, that connection and that, that starting to literally open up and connecting with people around me is what actually brought me to a place where I can say, um, this is my recovery. So, th so what she's saying is that with it's irreducible. We can't do it on our own. Um, let me just say for men, and this is, and I'm talking for men and I'm not a man, so forgive me for my ignorance, but one guy came up to Brene Brown one time. She's at a seminar and she's doing a book signing. And he said, excuse me, can I talk to you? And she said it was scary because he's a big guy. And the way he said it was like, okay. And, and, and his wife said, um, come on, let's just go. No, no, I just want to say a few things to her. And so the wife walked away, and he said, do you study men? And she said, no, primarily women. And he said, oh, that's convenient. <laughs> and she's like, what do you mean? And he said, I just want to say, my wife asked me to be vulnerable all the time and to connect. But she would rather me die on this white horse <laughs> than to get down and actually be vulnerable and to be needy myself. So make sure you study us before you start saying those kind of things. And he just walked away. And so she studied, started studying men and women. And our biggest need is to connect with each other, but it's really different, the expectations of men and the expectations of women. So when, s you, when you start to connect, especially for guys, um, open up to each other, really connect with each other. Because um, I think that you've, you're asked to carry a load by yourself without a lot of um, support. And um, does that make sense? And so just, just know that what, what they're saying is that we will continue to fall apart, we'll continue to seek out addictions, we'll continue to try to numb ourselves unless we start to connect. And at different levels, men and women are going to do it differently, we're going to connect differently, but we cannot do this without some kind of connection. We were just made to belong and to love each other. We were made to do that. 
Um, this kid right here, I adore her. Um, she, she came to my last meeting in Australia, and so that was, I don't know, a few months ago. And um, she's just a mess. Um, she's a mess, has all kinds of stuff she's dealing with and all kinds of things. And she says, you have a minute, you know. And when somebody says that, I know that you're lying. <laughs> you, you know, it never is a minute. But I said, yeah, but instead of, is there any way um, you can meet me maybe for tea or for lunch or whatever? Um, because um, we've got a lot of people happening at the seminars or whatever, but can we meet? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I meet her. She's Middle Eastern. I don't know if you can um, um, see that in her. But we meet um, for tea, and she has been bullied her whole life, some from the time she was a little kid. And she's talking about some stories, but she stays primarily on this relationship. She's in a, uh, a, an abusive situation with a fiancé, right? He has raped her. He has beat her. Um, he's verbally abusive. Um, and, and she says, you know what? How could I help him? So I just thought, you know, I just prayed, God, this girl is talking about all kinds of stuff. She's not even married yet. So most married women would say what? Run. You know, <laughs> what are you doing? You know, and I want to say run. But she's seriously looking at me like, I just want to help him. You know, what can I do? And maybe, maybe if I was different, he wouldn't hit me in the face like that. And, and so, you know, so I'm just listening. And I said, you know, could you remember the first time you were bullied? Like five, six years old through school. She was the only Middle Eastern kid at her school. Um, she was, she's adorable. She's funny. Um, she was bullied in high school. Even in high school, one, um, they're all going to the prom, and they acted like everybody was going, and they rented a limousine. The, the day of the prom, she is dressed, ready to step into the limousine, and they laughed and said, oh, we didn't invite you. And I just stopped. I, cu I, I couldn't imagine what that felt like. I couldn't imagine. Told me a number of different things. And I started writing them down. How, how did that make you feel? So I wrote the story, wrote how did it make you feel. The next one, how did it make you feel when you met this guy and he said this, how did it make you feel? And pretty soon I said, Sam, man, every one of these, you felt the same way. And she looked at the paper and she said, every one. She felt the same way, not enough, not loved, angry, sad, shamed, all that stuff. And I said, what if the strategy or the scheme of the enemy was the same with every injury? Every time he hits you, he hits you the same way. Man, let's take that to God. And she looked at me and she said, you know, I think God will heal me of that. <sighs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Being able to pray, look at the forgiveness issue. We went through the forgiveness issue. Because remember I said that, that from the time that you see a lie um, or the truth, all the lies are void. She finally saw the truth in who she is in Christ, and every one of these lies were voided out. It didn't work anymore. It was like pushing that little domino over. As they fell, I watched this girl come to life. I watched her. When her parents came to pick her up, she was a different kid, a different kid, no longer in bondage, no longer buying the not lies, no longer feeling disconnected or unusual. She realized that she was in a culture that just didn't accept her um, ethnically and that, um, and that she doesn't have to wear that her whole life. And she left a different kid. I, now we're friends. Her parents, of course, adore me. <laughs> you know, her kid's not trying to kill, himself, kill herself. And she started connecting again with her church, with her community, and now fully talks about her story and the domestic violence and why she was susceptible to that and is ministering to young women. And this happened just this last, not even a year. It's not even been a year. And this girl has come to life. And she's very connected with the people around her. So when you talk about restoration and not buying the lies, it's when you step into that, you are literally asking God to restore you and heal you from the lies. Walk me away from that. But you can't do that without connecting. She couldn't have done that without asking me, can I sit with you? And it could have been any of us that she asked. 
You know what I mean? But can I sit with you? Can I connect? Can I say out loud for the first time, I'm afraid? Can I go come over, Wendy, to your house, and can we process? And it's a matter of being brave enough, I believe, to start connecting with each other and having somebody then direct me back to God to, I think, has the answers, and that in our connection, we start to heal. I'm in um, a prison, and this is my favorite thing. I'm in a prison, and, you know, could you imagine? Last, uh, you know, it was a few months ago, actually. That, um, um, no, it wasn't even that long ago. It was here in New Zealand. I probably shouldn't have said that, but here in New Zealand. And they had me um, go to a federal penitentiary or a penitentiary for convicted sex offenders. Um, the first unit I went to are people that just got arrested. It was the hardest thing I ever did. They have no empathy for the victim. Um, they really don't understand the significance of their crime yet. There were 63 people there, and I, it was the hardest thing to tell the testimony and walk through that process with somebody that felt like they weren't doing anything wrong yet. And even afterwards, I, the girl I was with from Royal Oaks Church, I looked at her and I said, um, excuse me, but we have to go to the next unit, and would you mind if I just cried for a minute? And it scared her, you know? And I said, it, I, I'm okay, um, but I just need to cry. And I sobbed for about 15 minutes, took a breath, prayed, went to the next unit. And um, this next unit was people that were being discharged. Um, they had done some, a lot of their healing. Um, they had some empathy for the victim, and it was a different kind of presentation. But then we went to the women's prison. And I don't know if anybody's been in women's prisons, but those are, I feel like it's family members to me. <laughs> this is like, you know, this is, uh, uh, most of my family could have been in and out of prison easy. Um, some have been. But I went to the women's prison, and at first when you go to a women's prison, they'll look at you like, whatever, you know. And, and nobody, especially for someone like me, I look like Mary Poppins, you know. <laughs> So they, they look at me like whatever, and I come walking in, and you have to, you, you actually have to look around and say, who actually is in control here? Because I want to find the person in control, and I want to literally say, you know what? Um, man, this was, my recovery was tough, and I felt like everybody around me, I just wanted to grab them, and I wanted to say, you know what, I am done. And so I take the biggest one and literally lift her off the chair, throw her back down on the chair, and then turn around and finish the story. <laughs> the other women are looking like you are going to get yourself killed, you know. And I remember this woman that I grabbed, she's looking at me like, you didn't just do that. And I'm like, I so did. And I could tell that that moment was happening between us. I could do something. All the guards, because there are guards and the chaplains and everybody in the room, and all of a sudden the guards are like, just in case, <laughs> just moving in. And pretty soon she says, I like you. Everybody relaxes. The Holy Spirit comes in. We finish the testimony and the story. And afterwards she came up to me and she told me about her daughter. I have been in and out of prison my daughter's whole life, her whole life, and she loves me, and she just wept. I've been in and out of gangs, in and out of prison. Um, I've never been there for her because of all this addiction, all of this stuff, and she loves me, and she said, Do you, can we pray for her? And I thought, what an amazing opportunity. And, and they were trying to have us leave because it's, you know, they got to count and all that kind of stuff. And I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we got on our knees. I said, would you mind getting on our knees? We got on our knees. We prayed for the daughter. And at one point, I looked at her and I said, are you ready to forgive your mother yet? And she was furious, furious, absolutely not. Let me tell you, and she went on and on about her mom. No, 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 no. All of those tears were gone. All of a sudden, the guards were more visible again, <laughs> you know. And I said, you know, you're not going to find freedom until you can let this go. And we went back and forth for a few minutes, and then she said, okay, I'm ready, and she wept. And we prayed that she was able to take full responsibility for the pain and suffering her mom has caused, caused her and any scheme that the enemy has done against her or her family or her children be literally given back to God. And we prayed 
all of a sudden the healing was unbelievable. The guards let us stay for an additional hour. An additional hour that never happens. It was so ridiculous. And when she was done, I felt like, you know what, there were no guards, no bars. It was just like God was so present and healing was so real. And I start to walk out and the guards dealt with their issues and their children. The chaplain dealt with a granddaughter who was lost in pee and, and, and we just did ministry all the way out. But what happens in our restoration, in our recovery, is we have to say out loud, I hurt. This is a big deal. I'm angry. I can't forgive. I can't go there. And we start saying that to each other and we start getting released. The restoration starts happening and the foundation starts to be done. But even with this gang member in jail, right, and I don't know how long her sentence was, but even in jail, um, healing happened. And it was amazing to walk out and say, um, all of us have the same steps. Forgiveness, connection, and we start to open up to each other. And it's the scariest thing, because if I'm going to open up to you, what if you reject me? Right? And there's a possibility of that. But not everybody in this room will reject you. If you find someone, just pray for them, because that's the language of their wounds. But find someone else. But don't shut up again. Don't close off again. Because, man, you can close off to your last breath. Uh, but don't do it. Don't do it. Um, with this girl, I wish I could say the outcome of that. When I left, she was fully, um, I, I think, she was fully sold out to God and her own recovery. Um, there was also a kid that I met that I met at camp meeting six years ago. She started praying for her brothers because they're both heroin addicts, right? So I just get into town. I run into her husband, who's a pastor now, and she says, um, man, I, I met you at camp meeting. And she said, I've been praying for my brothers, you know, who are heroin addicts. And I said, you know, I have the afternoon off. Call them up and see if we can have lunch at their house. And she said, what? Just call them up, see if we can have lunch. And um, she said, all right. You know, she gets on her cell. Can we come over for lunch? Well, they're high. They're thinking, you're going to bring who? Well, I'd like to bring the evangelism over, the evangelist over. Is that all right? And you could see, I, I don't even know why they said yes to that. So we go over. We've got one hour. So know the time. We've got about an hour with these, these two brothers, and both of them, one just got out of prison. He's strung out on heroin. He's got his girlfriend there. She is pregnant with a child. They are slamming drugs like crazy. The other brother, the same thing, shooting up drugs, has his girlfriend, has two kids running around, and we're having lunch. So we're sitting there, and I'm thinking, this is the funniest thing I've ever done because i got to figure out, now how do I say, excuse me, can we talk about addiction, you know? And so we're sitting there and somehow God opens up like I'm there 10 minutes and I said did your sister tell you I'm a recovering heroin addict no no man it was hard coming off of that and I heard that you every once in a while um, have tried to recover and he looked at me like are we ha not having lunch I mean what's happening here and then pretty soon he totally opens up and the next thing that God gives me to say to him and please I just, I know that this is crazy, but he had two kids running around, and I said, can you do me a favor, pick one of your kids, and which one are you going to surrender to this addiction? If you have to bury one of them, which one would it be? And he said, what? Yeah, which one would it be? He said, I'm not going to pick one. That's not your choice. Uh, which one? Because you don't change, this is what their future, this is what they're going to be doing. So pick one. And he teared up and he said, I don't want to pick one. And I said, then you've got to fight. You've got to fight. And he just started talking about how scary it is. So we talk about that. He decides to share with me some stuff. And they decide that, you know what, I, I, I'm getting ready to leave. Remember I said I always have anointing oil with me? I'm getting ready to leave, and I said, um, before I leave, can I pray for you? And he looks around the room as if he's checking with someone. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess, you know. And so we go in the living room, and this guy is just beautiful. This is not their pictures, but he's just beautiful. And, and he's probably 19, 20, and I said, um, okay, we're going to pray for God to join you in your recovery, to be your recovery partner, to literally be your sponsor almost. You know, we're going to pray for that. Um, should you be standing or kneeling? What do you think? And he said, what? And I said, we're going to go to God. Spoke the world into existence. Creator God, should we stand or kneel? Just, I want it to be your choice. He said, man, I think we should kneel. <laughs> All right. So we got on our knees and did a prayer and an anointing, and I felt this guy heal. I felt the recovery happening. And so then the other brother, I forgot all about him. He said, hey, 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 <laughs> what about me? And so the whole time, the sister is pretty much crying. Like at camp meeting, when I started praying for my brothers, when I gave up my drugs because of your talk at camp meeting, I had no idea that someday you would be in my brother's kitchen praying for their recovery. Um, they came to every one of our meetings after that and right now are in the process of trying to get out of these addictions. And I mean, they are locked into them and trying to get out of them and talking about their children. When I got done with our presentation, the picture I showed you of the theater, I sent to one of the brothers because he's very artistic. And I said, I want you to blow this up and put it on your wall. Um, some days you're going to feel like it's worse than other days, but know you're in the restoration process, and you have connected, and you have surrendered that to God, and, and he just, why are you doing this? But why do we do it? Because we've got to connect with each other. We've got to almost be, when the Bible says that we're the light of the world, we're not the light of the world just because God needs a light bulb. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? That people need to know that we can recover and they pe the people need to know that sexual damage and spending stuff and drugs and all that kind of stuff, histories of molest, uh, dysfunctional families and families breaking up and aunties and uncles being out to lunch and seeing all that kind of stuff that we can heal from all of that. Restoration is possible from all of that. And if you know that, you got to tell someone. If I know that, I got to tell someone. And it's not I got to tell somebody that already gets it. I got to tell somebody that's lost in their addiction because you know what? When they get it, they can change. And the, this family has changed. It was an amazing um, honor to be with them. Um, um, I, I get home from doing that very outreach. And I get home, and what's really crazy, let me go back um, to here, but what's really crazy when I get home is I get home, and does anybody know the Charlie game that was on Facebook for uh, forever? Anybody know that? So kids were playing this game. Does it, nobody knows that game? So kids were playing this game all over the world, and, and it's inviting this demon named Charlie to play with them. And um, um, then they'd scream, yell, and they would videotape it and stuff. And, and, um, and, and I thought, really? I'm, I'm trying to work with people to get out of that, you know, to get out of those addictions and all that demonic torment. And these kids were playing this game. And I thought, no way. You know, so the game was really popular. It went viral. I mean, millions of kids were doing this, and it was just viral, and this was probably a few months ago. And so then I, so I'm thinking, I'm trying to think about that. I just watched a gang member in a prison literally get freedom where there were bars and guards all, all around us, and we couldn't even see them anymore. And then I'm watching these normal kids jumping into bondage, and I'm thinking, what's happening? You know, what's happening with that? And then I literally um, uh, turn on the television, and I'm watching something, and and I see this new series, and it's called Lucifer. And I thought, really? What's that about? Has anybody seen the trailer for that? Oh, yeah, so it's called Lucifer. But the devil himself gets bored with being the devil. So he quits his job, buys a pub in L.A. <laughs> I'm serious. And I thought, oh, shut up. There's no way. So now he's a bartender in Los Angeles. Um, and there's this cute... 
LAPD officer that's trying to solve crimes and the devil in her hookup, and he's going to help her crime fight. So he is now the new superhero. The devil, the God has lied to you. I'm actually the good guy. And now he is like Captain America. He's changing the world and doing all that kind of stuff. The writing for this series is brilliant, brilliant. And literally, the entertainment um, factor in that series is done with the best writers, the best entertainment. Just like Scandal, I think the, the budget for some of those are, are, are $5 million an episode. I mean, this is not something that's lightweight, but th it's Lucifer, so it's the devil getting a new job. Um, what's an interesting about all of that to me, there's another movie that I saw during that same time period was called um, Game of Thrones. Anybody know that? It was a video game, now it's a series. The closing of the opening season was this girl, um, five years old, being raped and thrown out a window to her death. And that's our entertainment. So even as you choose to get well, I want to say be really careful because you're going to have to make a choice. Not only that you have to connect with each other, we have to connect. Um, I met you and I adore you. I adore you. There's something about you that I just thought we could be friends, literally could be friends. And so now uh, I know about her. The only reason I can say that is she was brave enough to share with me some pretty interesting things that caused that connection. If you just walked by and you never shared with me, I would have never known that, right? So we start to connect with each other. We literally start to open up and heal in ways that we haven't healed, and I can walk alongside of you in my recovery, in your recovery, and our friendship actually will strengthen each of us, right? But what happens now in our recovery is we get quieter, more isolated, more shame-based. I get online. I start doing my addictions. I start watching crazy stuff for entertainment, and I'm more and more in bondage. So when you start looking at recovery and healing, you have to make a choice, and the choice is really huge right now. I can game. I can get online. For, for guys, and please, with guys, just kick me if I get this wrong. Um, sometimes with, with there's so much stress and emphasis on the guy being everything and all knowing and being able to be the providers and, and to take care of the family and all that kind of stuff. And then we, we, we rag on them sometimes. Raise your hand if, if you've ever ragged on your husband about stuff. So we literally do that stuff. And sometimes they can get in five minutes online with a stranger what they can't get from us, right? No hassle, no disrespect, no anything. And they can jump into addiction here because this much is too much pressure. And, and, and I think that even um, just repenting of that. And for guys saying you've got to educate the people around you, um, um, and you've got to be open, not open with us and, and getting off the white horse right away because we really don't let you get off too much, um, but literally start to do that because you'll die up there. You'll die up there, and we miss you. So it's like even in a recovery to say that I'm, I'm willing to start doing it differently and stop going. Um, a lot of people are workaholics. Um, because it's just like you can get gratification from there that you can't get home. A lot of people are lost in sexual addictions. Um, a lot of people are angry and doubt doing all that kind of stuff because we don't really know how to love and take care of each other. And so part of recovery, not only surrendering my own stuff, doing the forgiveness stuff, but being brave enough to literally open up to each other, start to connect, and then connect with a community. Um, for men, you will understand each other more than we understand you. Because, you, th you know, to, to me, sometimes Brad will say something. Like, I didn't know for my husband. We started doing a lot of work um, together, um, I, I don't know, five, seven years ago. It was serious work. And at one point, I'm looking in the mirror thinking, you know what? Am I kind of pretty enough for him still? And I'm getting older, and what does that mean? And, and he says, you know what? I just like to laugh with you. When we get on our bike together, we go play golf. I don't look at you and say, man, are you, what size are you right now? I say, I'm the luckiest guy ever. I'm playing golf with my wife, and we're laughing. Do you know what I mean? And for men, sometimes we think that it's about how we look and all that kind of stuff. It literally, and tell me if I'm right or wrong on this, sometimes it's, they just want to hang out. Um, 
They're not saying, man, are you, uh, did you go up a size? <laughs> you know, you know, <laughs> you know man, you, you know, we, we got bikes together and we're cycling. We're doing century rides together and it's ridiculously fun. But, you know, he's not asking me how old you are. He's saying, you know, I can't believe um, that you're my wife. And so it's a matter of really starting to open up with each other and say, you know, how can I love you better? Because I think it's about this, and it may not be about that at all. Um, and when he tells me, you know what, hon, it's about this, I, I want to play. I want to go out and not talk about stuff. I want to ride a bike or play golf. Or When we do get intimate, and excuse me for saying this, because I heard in New Zealand you don't even talk about sex ever, but when we do get intimate, he said, I just want to know that you adore me. Do you know what I mean? Do, do you still adore me? Am I still enough for you? And I thought, well, I thought it was all about me and my size. <laughs> He's like, stop. And so it's like even being able to realize that I've got to find out what it's about because, you know, we're getting more and more disconnected and I don't even realize that for him it's not about any of that. He never looks at me and thinks that. He looks at me and says, do you still... Am I still, do I still look good on my white horse? <laughs> you know what I mean? Do, you know? And so, you know, being able to in our healing and our restoration is speak to each other because once we start to connect, the world cannot come against us. We'll stop looking at entertainment in the same way. I'll stop trying to escape in the same way. Um, you know, for our kids, our kids, they said the number one reason people choose same-sex lifestyles, you know what the number one reason is? Because they've watched parents that don't like each other. And they say, I don't want to do that. Number one reason is us. And I'm thinking, really? We're the number one reason? It's no longer all this other crazy stuff? And so how do we like each other? How do we move back into that thing? How do I move back into friendships in a more honest way? And the bottom line is we have to stop hiding. You know, we have to trust the fact that I can come out of hiding with you. And, uh, you know, and, and um, man, it's a scary thing. Because Brad and I, when we first started doing that, is, you know, if you saw the real me, would you like me? And not only, <laughs> not only do we like each other, um, you know, I adore him. He adores me. So I don't know what we were afraid of, but we adore each other. And uh, you go through that period where you're going to have to rediscover each other, but do it. And so connect with your s God, with forgiveness, with each other. If you're married and have children, all of that stuff, give them time. Because you know what I, my, my most, um, the saying that I say every single day, at least once, is I no longer have to shrink or puff up. Does anybody hear that? I can actually just be myself. I can look in the mirror and say I'm enough. I don't have to say, you know what, I'm enough, but man, I'll be, I, I'll be 60 this year. Crazy. What happened? Um, but that's not the issue anymore. I don't even ask myself, what size do I wear now? I mean, I want to be in shape, and, I, and man, I could lose a few pounds or whatever, but you know what? I'm not defined by that anymore. I'm enough. I'm enough. You're enough. And it's like being able to disconnect from all of the lies and entertainment and marketing and commercials and what we kind of turn on and escape with. You got to disconnect and find out what's real and connect. And again, the reason this church is following with these groups, these friendship groups, and they're not going to be counseling groups or any of that kind of stuff, just a group where you could sit down with somebody and say, I'm enough. I'm enough. You know, what am I hiding? Hey, how about if I just leave that um, out of my pockets for now and, um, and, and just get on with your healing? Um, one of the things that I think is amazing to me about restoration is restoration, I believe, is a lifetime work. Um, but I believe that the first time you get to laugh out loud, it's worth it. The first time I'm actually done with all these lies, it's worth it. The first time I can look in the mirror and just say, you know what, um, look at you. And not look at you in any kind of vanity way, just look at you. 
You know, I didn't think I'd get a week recovery or a, a month recovery, and now I'm 35 years clean. How crazy is that? Thank you for that. You know, you know, and so even being able to say is that my daily thing is I, I actually buy the fact that I am worth knowing. You are worth knowing, right? Um, but you've got to be brave enough to come out of hiding. And as an as a organization, as a church, as a group, as we start to connect with each other and as we stop um, believing all the lies and literally start to heal, um, for one, our personal restoration is amazing, our family restoration is amazing, and our organizational church um, restoration is amazing. Because, you know, there's a number of churches represented here. So, you know, and people that don't go to church. So there's a number of churches represented here. If God can restore us personally, he can restore us organizationally. And so regardless of what church you're in, um, I believe that as we get well, everything else, like the little domino, <laughs> everything else follows it. But if we don't get well, that little domino stops everything. If you don't push that first one, Nothing else falls. Do you hear what I'm saying? So we've got to say, I'm willing to do that first one. And I want to uh, say right now, is there anybody, is there anybody that has, and so Brian, you, you're going to be third on this question. Is there anybody that has a question or a comment about what was talked about tonight, about restoration? I know you guys are quiet, so I'll just wait. Should I sit down? <laughs> yes. You believe it's what? It's a solution to the so let me repeat before you go on. There's a Bible verse um, that says, confess your sins one to another, pray for each other so you can be healed. Depends on what vision version so faults sins addictions all that kind of stuff so i believe that it's encompassing um i think that if you wanted to take that to a really current thing it would say talk to each other pray for each other there's healing that comes from that and that's exactly what we said but it, the reverse is true too don't talk to each other don't pray for each other and you will stay sick yeah I think it's the most, one of the most powerful verses in the Bible. Um, there's also Isaiah 58, which is an amazing um, um, chapter. And Isaiah 58 says, love one another. And when you do this, your very diseases will lift. Um, your bones that are dried and brittle will get subtle, su supple. You'll end up being like a watered garden. You know, the healing that comes from just loving each other is huge. And when you do this, your darkest times, your depressions, will be as noonday. So it's like being able to say, as we start to connect and as we start to heal, um, the Bible promises over and over and over some really deep healing in that, some really um, intense things from depression to physical disease to all of that. Y you know, like, have you seen a watered garden? You'll be like a watered garden. Come sit down with me, hang out with me. And so I think that there's, there's a healing that comes with a connection that doesn't happen any other way. And if we don't connect... I think we should shut the doors of our churches. Um, I think that, it, that it's not a matter of, like even Isaiah 58 says, I'm not asking you to teach doctrine. I'm not asking you to debate issues. I'm not asking you to do all that kind of stuff, even though all of that is important. What I'm asking you to do is love one another. Um, we need to be loved and cuddled. We need to be held. Um, you know, the first time I came into a church, could you imagine... Ten years on the street, I look like a little hooker. I came running, running in the door. Woohoo! <laughs> I just met God. You know, how are you guys? Because this is the most incredible thing that it's ever, you know. And I am like, people are looking at me like, can you just sit down, you know? And so it's a, it, I, I was so crazy. But I learned right away um, to be quiet. 
I can't even imagine. I spent 10 years not saying anything to anyone about my background or my journey or whatever. And it almost killed me. But I'm at a Doug Batchelor. Does anybody who knew Doug Batchelor is? I'm at a Doug Batchelor revelation thing. And I decided I'm going to sit right in front because that's Doug Batchelor. You know, he was a naked druggie that found God. And I thought, how fun is that going to be? So, <laughs> so I'm like in the front row, and I want to hear the whole story. And, and, and there's a thousand people in this room. It was a huge church, so I'm in the front row. I'm, and only reason because I'm ADD and I get sidetracked easy, so I, I'm sitting up front and listening to Doug, and he's talking about different things. And all of a sudden, it felt like every single person in the church turned around. And I thought, what is happening back there? So I turn around, <laughs> and this hooker comes walking in the door. She's obviously a short, tiny little thing on, tiny little outfit on. She'd been crying, so I had mascara just streaming down her face. And I thought, man, and this is the saddest thing that I thought, this may not be a safe place for you. Does any Raise your hand if you understand what I'm saying may not be a safe place for you. And, but I tried to li act like I didn't see her because, man, I don't want her to call me out. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Because I'm not telling anybody anything about my background. And so um, um, she walks down the aisle. I'm in the front row. She comes and sits next to me. I thought, no, you don't. <laughs> I'm trying to be normal. <laughs> So, and so I am like, I can't believe she just sat next to me because I'm trying to be normal. And so Doug asks us to answer a question and break into groups of four or five and answer this question. So he gives us, you know, time to do that. She, of course, comes in our group, and she says something about smoking. She smokes cigarettes. And I thought, oh, honey. <laughs> You know, she smells like weed. She's crying like crazy. I, you know, you know. I know. You know that that cigarettes is the least of your issues. I'm just saying. And somebody in the group decided to tell her that you know smoking's bad for you. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, oh, stop. So I turned around and I said, you know what? For ten years, I was strung out and living on the streets of L.A. Um, I'd worked in clubs, sold drugs. 42 warrants for my arrest when I found Christ, and the only thing I can tell you is don't stop seeking God because he will help you. And the whole group never heard me say a thing about that. They're saying, did you just make that up to help her feel better? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> just, just thought it would work, you know. And so anyway, so in the meantime, we go back into our regular group, and she takes off. And I cannot find her. And I'm thinking, I don't want what we said to have hurt her, so I want to talk with her. And I turn around. I'm trying to find her in the group. Doug is talking again and going on with the sermon. And I'm, like, in the front row, and I am trying to figure out where did she go, you know? And I realize that I'm really disrupting the speaking. <laughs> So, of course, I sat down, and afterwards, I tried to find her. I looked in the, the church. I looked in the, in the foyer. I looked in the bathroom, and I could not find her. Doug, at that time, was a traveling evangelist. So I thought, I'm a homeless kid in recovery. I can find anybody. So I'm going to find where they housed him. You know, where is he housed? They had put him at a hotel. I found his room, and it took me until about 11 o'clock at night. I called him up. Hello, <laughs> my name is Cherie. And I told him about this hooker that walked in and what was said and all that kind of stuff. And he's literally trying to be polite, but I just called his hotel room like at 11 o'clock at night, and I'm some crazy person. So I said to him, Doug, you need to call her. And he said, I invited her. And I thought, oh, stop. So he said, I know exactly who you were talking about. I invited her. I talked with her during the day. And I said, then you need to call her because I think that we hurt her. And he stopped and just got quiet. But I could tell he was a little irritated. And, and uh, does anybody can tell when somebody's irritated at you? So I could tell he's a little irritated. And so I'm thinking, okay, what just happened? And he said, you know what? God didn't sit her next to me. And I thought, what do you mean by that? <laughs> he said, you call her. And I said, no, no, I'm nobody. And he said, God set her next to you. 
Don't push her off on the pastor. Don't push her off on the evangelist. Don't literally walk away and say somebody else would do this. You call her. Something about your journey is going to touch her. And he hangs up on me. He had just given me her phone number, but I'm thinking, wait, wait, wait. I am nobody. You can't, you, you can't even do this. I'm not even, I don't need, I don't know anything. You know, um, man, I, I, don't, I just don't know anything. And so, and so I got convicted after a few days, and I called her. She was a stripper, bisexual. Um, she'd been lost by a family member most of her life. She was suicidal. And I was the only one, I think, in that thousand people that could have talked with her. The only one. So when we start to heal, when we start to connect, when we start stop being ashamed of our journey and our story, you are going to use the very thing that almost killed you to bring life to someone else. And it's weird to see it happen, but it happens. Our restoration starts happening in ways that we can offer that to someone else because of who we are and what connection means. But don't hide and get lost in an addiction. I don't care if the addiction is entertainment, spending, any of that kind of stuff, because as you're lost, the next person beside you is lost. So it's be, be brave enough to say, I'm done. Um, God, if there's anything that needs to be restored in me, restore it. If there's anything in my relationship, in my family, and some people are going to be overwhelmed by saying that because there's so much damage around us, but God is bigger. God is bigger. Hopeless situations actually can be turned around. If you've got to grab a counselor, if you've got to grab a pastor, if you've got to grab a friend, if you've got to jump into a group, however you do it, connect with people and just trust that the most hopeless situation will take the next step and the next step and the next step. I was on the streets homeless, no teeth strung out, illiterate, and now I have an international organization that I'm CEO of. And not saying that that's a big deal or whatever, but I, it's an amazing thing to know that on day one when I stepped out of the drug house, I had no idea what my next step was going to be. And then on day two, and then 21 years later when I'm dealing with those trust issues, and when I finally decide to look at Brad and say, you know what, who are you really, and are we going to actually do this relationship in a healthy way, and committing to that. And each step has freed me up. I no longer feel that I'm in bondage to some of those big areas. I still feel um, that I daily need to do my program. I daily need to connect with people that are doing their program because it's how we heal. Um, so again, any questions before I turn it over to the pastor? Any comments? Yes, sir. Yeah, Woohoo! Yeah. Yeah. It's a hard thing to quit. It was harder than heroin for me. No, no, I'm encouraging the church, church to start this program, but you should encourage about the smoking. Do you hear what I'm saying? Everybody has a voice. Right now, to me, I think friendship recovery ministries is the most important thing for me. Somebody else thinks cigarettes. Somebody else is going to think diet. Somebody else is going to think marriage. So everybody has a voice. But if we all try to be all things, um, we're going to lose that voice. My voice says we got to connect with each other. And so, um, and so I hear what you're saying, but I think that's your voice and not mine. Um, I'm going to end with one thing then, and I always say that, and, and I promise I'll try to make this one true. Um, um, I went to a seminar. Somebody said to me um, that it's important to learn how to eat right and be right in that way. And I had no idea what they were talking about. I, you know, I had just gotten back from McDonald's. I'm thinking, What? Well, and so I went to this seminar, and again, a huge group, um, and this gay guy runs down the aisle, and he's giving the seminar on health, and I thought, um, kind of interesting, but I'm listening, 
and, um, and he said something in the seminar, and I'm waiting to take notes because somebody said that if I ate better, I would heal emotionally, right? And I thought, how cool is that? You know, eat a little brown rice and I'll be good, you know? And so, so I, I'm like in the front row, and he said something about, you know, if you've had a hamburger, you might as well have killed someone. And I thought, excuse me? You know, he actually said you might as well have gone to Mustang Ranch, which is a house of prostitution. And, and so I knew all that. And, and finally, I'm thinking, is anybody buying this? <laughs> I'm looking around thinking, I just want to, I want to strangle this guy. And if you're a health nut, please forgive me, because I am a health nut now. But this was, he was wrong in what he said. So anyhow, so he's going on and on and on, and he's talking about he's a triathlon athlete and all this kind of stuff. And finally, I just had it. I'm in the front row. I'm like, excuse me, just have something I want to say. <laughs> and I think I had my hand up. And this, I, gotta, I, I have to ask God for forgiveness for this for about 10, 15 minutes. Finally, he said, what? And I said, because he kept talking about his own stuff. And obviously, he had sexual addictions because of the gay thing. That I thought, you know what, if one sin is no different than another, then man, how are you doing? <laughs> and I didn't want to call him out. I just called him out on the pride issues, but, you know, because I don't think he was telling anybody he was gay. So, so anyhow, so I said, how are you doing with that pride stuff? Because, you know, and, and, and so he looked at me, everybody got quiet, and I thought probably is a good time to leave, you know. <laughs> so, so I walked down the aisle, and I got home, and I sobbed like a baby because I thought, what if he's right? And I just don't, I'll never be enough. What if he's right? And I thought, I, I don't know. I don't have anywhere to go. Do I end up back on the streets? Do I slam some more heroin? Do I do whatever? And I just wept and wept and wept. Have you ever cried so hard that it's like snot dripping out of your face, kind of weeping? I just wept. And finally, God gives me a vision. And I got to say, this vision was life-changing for me. He gave me a vision of something that happened when I was a kid. I was very young. I was living in a drug house. Um, we were waiting for some heroin to come in. Everybody was... Um, you know, you get tense when you're out and somebody's doing a drug run. And, and so we're all waiting, right? And it's, it's just a weird time. And they came in with a drug. We got our spoons out. We're cooking things up. We're, we're shooting as much as I, I tend to always use. And, and, and um, it was too potent. It was more, um, it was just too potent. I, I, I died instantly. So I die. My friends do CPR, which when you see a bunch of drug addicts doing CPR, they are not certified, I'm just saying. So anyhow, when it happened, I don't remember a thing. I wasn't there. I was out. When you die and go into seizures and that stuff, you lose bowel and bladder control. It is not an easy, nice thing to see. My friends freaked out. They put me in the shower. They're trying to clean me up, and I threw up all over the place. Now they have to breathe for me again, and I've got vomit in my mouth. And there, somebody is saying, you know what? I'm not doing it. <laughs> but, you know, luckily I had people in the room that said, you know, We've got to do this. And they did CPR. They cleaned the vomit out of my mouth and breathed for me, and I came out. I mean, they put ice in me and on me and all that stuff. And so God gave me a vision of what that scene looked like, and it was disgusting. And, you know, I don't know if anybody's seen someone um, OD or die or whatever, but it was disgusting. But I saw it. felt like I saw it. I smelt it. I felt like I was there again. And then when I came to, you know, the only thing I thought about when I came to is, did you steal my drugs? You know what I mean? Because, man, when I was out, <laughs> I had more than this, you know. And so that was the only thing I thought about. When God took me back in that vision, I was angry at him because I'm sitting in a church not feeling good enough because I don't know how to eat, not feeling good enough because I can't measure up. And now I see a scene of myself with vomit all over me, with feces all over me, and I'm thinking, why did you show me that? I'm so broken. I'm so angry. And what he said is, I want you to know that when you were lying in your own feces, I loved you. I am your father. This is not a behavioral thing. I will not give up on you. I will not turn my back on you. How could I leave you to destroy yourself, even though you're choosing this? I will not, and I cannot. And I remember that changing my life. Somebody around you may judge you, but it is not God. 
Um, does he want us to eat right and be right and behave? Absolutely, because it's better for us. But he said, in the midst of your craziness, we'll get home. And so when you start to heal, when you start this restoration, know that there's a God in heaven that knows exactly who you are, will be with you every step of that way, and every relapse he'll be with you. Every time you stand up, every time you are so full of shame that you think, I'd just rather blow my head off, he said, don't do it. We will get through this. And when you get to a point where your legs are stronger, connect with someone else. Help someone else. You are the light of the world. Um, literally, the group said, um, Pastor, let me interview you. <laughs> Am I allowed to turn that on him? But even when you start to say, you know, when somebody says, why are you doing the groups that you're doing? Why do you do these friendship connection groups? Um, tell them, why, why do you do it? I'd have to say from personal experience, I just I know what it's like to be lost mm -hmm. in that place. And um, I guess in my own journey, it's been a case of recovery is an ongoing thing. Mm -hmm. And you need people around to support you. Um, I've seen from myself and I've seen from people who made it and people who didn't make it that this is the key component. Amen. You know, it's relationships vertically, relationships horizontally. And without that component, all the knowledge in the world only leads to a greater sense of condemnation because we know more and yet we continue to fail. Absolutely. And when you have that combination of knowing but just ongoing failure, I mean, that's soul destroying. When I can sit, and I love when you say that because when I can sit with you, um, Adrian, and I know, like, w like I, I had, I mean, uh, you were drugging in recovery, um, into raves and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, but I wouldn't have known that, right? So now I sit with him, and he's an incredible man of God, an incredible father and husband and all that kind of stuff. And I don't mean incredible and, and perfect, but just that I know what he's My committed to. I know. I, I talk <laughs> with him. <laughs> but, you know, it's like <laughs> so, but just incredible. And so I know his journey. So when I step into relationship in a group setting with him, I don't have to be afraid. Like I can say, you know what, today was not an easy day. And, and, and instead of him telling me, well, just pray more, he's going to say, yeah, I hate those days. And that's what friendship groups or recovery groups are about, is you're not going to have somebody just give you pet answers. You literally will walk along somebody, uh, side somebody that is walking in their own recovery, and it's life-changing. Um, I'm going to shut up because I went way over, and um, I'm going to turn it over to you. And so should I sit down? Any other questions before I sit down? All right. Yeah, we actually um, just finished running some of those groups. Uh, one group in Dargaville, one here in Whangarei. And uh, those that were in that group, it was just a great opportunity to be authentic, to share things, to be vulnerable. And, and you know that it's what goes around comes around in that sense. And it's an interesting dynamic. You know, you find that as, as one person has the courage to stand up and say, mm, well, this is me. This, this, is, this is not just my public face, but let me tell you about me. You kind of expect maybe a little bit of judgment and condemnation. And then you find somebody else gets the courage to go, well, let me tell you about this too. And you just kind of, it's just a dynamic that grows in the group as you share. And, uh, and what a privilege. You know, I've had the privilege of being the pastor here at this church for five and a half years now. Same in Dargaville. I pastor three churches in the area, Tikipanga, Whangarei, and um, Dargaville, and the chaplain of our, of our Adventist school in Cow Valley. And, uh, you know, these are people I see so often, and yet I learn something new. And we were able to pray together and share together. And... Uh, some of you are in the, some of you are here today um, that have been on that journey. So, yeah, on the 22nd of July, we'll start another journey like that with people who are interested in, um, in sharing themselves and recovering. So what we want to do is just uh, close up this time with, with prayer for all of us. And then again, just letting you know, we'll have those ministry teams here up front for you if you want to connect as we've been talking about this, this afternoon, and if you want to pray. So uh, we're here for you to do that on a more one-on-one -on -one personal basis. Um, but I invite you just, um, you know, if you sense that uh, 
you sense that you need to connect, um, take that step. I know it's scary. Uh, and to some extent, you, you, we're, so, we're, we're inviting you to connect with people to, who you, to, to, to whom you may be strangers, and that's even scarier. Um, but I want to say that the courage will be rewarded with healing and with restoration. So I invite you just to bow your heads as we pray together. Father in heaven, today uh, today has just been, well, it's been something else. And I just want to give you thanks again that, uh, that you've brought Cherie on this journey to the place where she can share the kind of things that she's sharing. And I pray that we would learn to follow her example. And I pray that you would also, in all our sharing, that there'd be a genuine sense of caring and genuine sense of uh, humility to go with that. May we never boast in our craziness, but may we learn to boast in the God who heals us. And I pray for each person here, Lord. Um, we have so many different backgrounds and so many different ideologies and philosophies. And uh, what I just pray, Lord, is that you would show yourself to be real. If there is anybody in this room can see something better, senses that they need something better, but because of what they've seen in terms of religion and what they've heard and been taught about spiritual things, just can't entirely bring themselves to connect with you, surrender to you, talk to you. Lord, I'm praying for that person and asking you to show up in their life in a way that makes sense to them, in a way where they see you, in a way that they know that they know that you are real. And I pray that you would take hold of them. So Jesus, I pray for each of us that you would teach us to connect with our husbands and wives, with our children, with our church families, with people around us, and, um, and to take us beyond needing to connect for our healing, but to take us to that place where we're connecting to be a blessing and healing for somebody else. So fill us in that way. Use us as your servants. In Jesus' name, amen. Right, we want to thank you for being with us today. When do we meet again?